I will now call the meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee to order on May 5th, 2021. Will the esteemed secretary please take the roll? Vice Chair Canizaro. Uh, she is on her way. Will you please mark her present when she arrives? Senator Orenshaw. Here. Senator Harris. She's also on her way. If you'd mark her present when she arrives. Senator, Se Senator Settlemeyer. Please mark him present when he arrives. Senator Hansen. Please mark him present when he arrives. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Pickard. I'm here. And <laughs> Chair Scheibel. I am here. I have arrived. And um, I'm sure that the rest of the committee will be joining us soon. Uh, we have three bills on the agenda today. We are going to go um, in reverse numerical order, starting with AB202, then we'll do AB132, then AB42. Um, with that being said, I will open the hearing now on AB202. And whenever you're ready, uh, Chair Yeager, oh, please mark Senator Harris present. She has arrived. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Steve Yeager. I represent Assembly District 9 in Southwest Las Vegas. It's my pleasure this afternoon to present Assembly Bill 202 in its first reprint. I also have with me Mr. Mike Morton from the Gaming Control Board. He is on the Zoom, as you can see, and he's here to help answer any questions you might have about charitable gaming and charitable lot lottery registration program. Assembly Bill 202 in its first reprint is not overly complicated. It simply caps the annual fees that a qualified organization must pay to conduct charitable gaming. It caps those fees at $10 a year if the total value of the prizes offered by the organization in a calendar year does not exceed $100,000. And it only requires one annual registration with the Gaming Control Board. The intent of the bill is to ensure that the qualified organization is able to keep more of the money it collects to fund its activities and also to cut some of the red tape associated with charitable gaming. Now for a very short bit of history, Assembly Bill 117 from last legislative session, the 2019 session, which was an Assembly Judiciary Committee bill, made some changes to our charitable gaming statute. One of those changes was to remove the fee structure from statute and allow the Gaming Control Board to enact regulations setting the fee structure. The Gaming Control Board did just that in revising and adopting Regulation 4A in October of 2019. That enacted a fee of $25 for each event or day that an event was offered or for each tournament conducted. Although the chair of the Gaming Control Board has the discretion to waive all or part of that fee and did so on occasion since the regulation was adopted, I began to hear from smaller charitable organizations that the fee structure adopted resulted in higher fees than they had previously paid or that they had to request fee waivers on a more regular basis. I know many members of this committee heard those same concerns from constituents. COVID hit and then most of these events simply did not happen because charitable gaming really wasn't taking place. So I thought it made sense while we had the opportunity to statutorily limit those fees for smaller organizations so they don't have to go through the fee waiver process each time and they can keep more of the funds. It will also save the Gaming Control Board some time in having to review and approve fee waivers. So that is essentially what Assembly Bill 202 in its first reprint does. I will let the committee members know I have one conceptual amendment that I provided that you will find on Nellis. I'll go through that very quickly. The amendment has three parts. In part one, it clarifies that video lottery terminals, also known as VLTs, are included in the definition of lottery. Video lottery, lottery terminals are proliferating around the nation, particularly in states where lotteries are legal. Of course, lotteries are not legal in the state of Nevada. Unlike Nevada slot machines that use a random number generator for payouts, VLTs are linked to a central network that connects the individual VLTs in a particular casino or in a geographic region, just like a lottery. Furthermore, in many states, VLTs are beginning to crop up in locales that do not have appropriate gaming regulation, creating problems for local and state jurisdictions. For those reasons, I'm bringing an amendment like this one in front of you to make clear that VLTs are not permitted to operate in the state of Nevada. Second, the amendment clarifies that only professional sports organizations would be able to conduct online charitable gaming and only in conjunction with the cash prize when the team is playing a home game in Nevada and only at the team's arena or stadium or the land upon which it sits. 
Uh, think about the Vegas Golden Knights and their 51-49 raffle that some of you may be familiar with. This would allow them to have their customers use mobile devices to be able to purchase the tickets rather than have to go into the stands and find a vendor. I think this is an appropriate limitation on the proliferation of online charitable gaming. And then the Third Amendment is very easy. It just moves the effective date to July 1, 2021 to give the GCB a little bit more time because they'll need to adjust their regulations to uh, align with this bill should it pass. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, with that, Chair, I appreciate the time and would be happy to answer any questions. All right. Do we have questions from members of the committee? Senator Hansen. Thanks, Chair. Uh, actually, it goes back to AB 117. The, we were all told it was the Golden Knights bill, but we ended up discovering that the buried in the bill was a provision which eliminated the ability for all sorts of um, non, not-for-profit organizations to have charitable lotteries, basically. Uh, everything from raising bake sales at schools to political organizations that raise a few hundred bucks for various uh, reasons. Nothing in your bill looks like that changes, though. So I'm kind of hoping that my old buddy... Chairman Yeager would do some, because we all got beat up pretty good on this. For It's like, why in the hell would you guys support that? And needless to say, I'd love to have a chance to f correct uh, what we did in 117. Any hope of that? Uh, Steve Yeager, for the record, through you, Chair, to Senator Hansen. I have also uh, had those uh, issues raised on the Assembly side from uh, Assemblywoman Hansen and others. And... I'll just note for the record that currently the structure is this. If you are a 501c3, you can do charitable gaming. If you're not, you can't do charitable gaming. And I think that creates a nice bright line rule for the Gaming Control Board because when they get an application, they can ask, are you a 501c3? And if the answer is yes, you can do it. If the answer is no, you can't do it. Um, in thinking about this issue, uh, I don't feel comfortable moving beyond that because I think we get into some real gray areas when we have organizations that aren't 501c3s that want to do charitable gaming. So that's sort of where I'm at on it. I've had further discussions about it, but I, I don't want to do that in this bill because I think for clarity for the Gaming Control Board, it just makes sense to have that bright line rule. Realizing that not everyone's a 501c3 and there are clearly charitable and civic organizations that are not, but I think that is an appropriate step to have that status to make it very clear in the state who can participate and who cannot. Fair enough, but I would say, um, all due respect to Mr. Morton, the ability of the Gaming Control Board to block virtually every type of lottery or thing like that is, is disturbing to me. There is definitely a move in Nevada to, to see a, some sort of a lottery actually become a way to raise money. Uh, I support that. And, f and while it's nice for them to have a nice clean line of demarcation between what's 501c3 and what isn't, uh, it, it's really hamstrung a, a tremendous number of small organizations that don't have the funds or lawyers to go out and become a 501c3. So while I respect your opinion on it, I would like to, on the record, say I think we should fix that problem that we created, I think unintentionally, at least on all the parts, because I think everybody in the building supported the thing. And I'd like to see that uh, mistake corrected. So all due respect to Chairman Yeager, I would still hope that we could, uh, could do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Any other questions? All right, I don't see any questions, so we will move to testimony in support of AB202. I see somebody in the audience getting up to provide support testimony, so we will start with you, and you'll have two minutes. Chair and committee members, my name is Andrew Lee Pilbit. I represent the combat wounded veterans of the Purple Heart in the state of Nevada, the 65,000 disabled American veterans in the state of Nevada, and I am the current chair of the United Veterans Legislative Council for Nevada, representing 250,000 veterans and 500,000 Nevadans when you count their families. Uh, like uh, Senator Hansen said, we were uh, pretty hit by the last session in this previous bill. Uh, a lot of our veterans groups, they make their money for their scholarships and things like that right from some of their meetings. And they have things like what's called a 50-50. And all of those things ended the day that last bill was passed. This rectifies a significant part about that for our veterans organizations in the state. We also object to the fiscal note because that income didn't exist for the last year and a half. 
I don't know how there could be a fiscal note on this bill. So the United Veterans Legislative Council, the Disabled American Veterans in Nevada, and the Combat Wounded Veterans in Nevada support the passing of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your service. That appears to be the only person in person to give a testimony in support of AB202, so we will go to the phones, please. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 202, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in support on Assembly Bill 202, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair, at this time, there are no callers to provide support testimony. All right, we will move to testimony in opposition to AB202. I don't see anybody present to give testimony, so we will move to testimony via phone, please. Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 202, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 202, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair, at this time, there are no callers to provide opposition testimony. All right, we will move to testimony in the neutral position on AB202. Not seeing anybody present to give such testimony, we will go to the phones, please, Mr. Kyle. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 202, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 202, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair, at this time, there are no callers to provide neutral testimony. All right, thank you so much. Unless you have any closing comments, okay. We will take closing comments from the sponsor. Um, Steve Yeager, for the record, the only thing I wanted to mention, because the fiscal note was brought up, I wanted to let the committee know that the bill was heard in Ways and Means. I think there was a small fiscal note of a, a few thousand dollars, and uh, Ways and Means chose to process the bill uh, despite that fiscal note. So I just want to let the committee know it has gone through that process, and that's frankly why it's here a little bit later than uh, I would have preferred. But uh, with that, uh, Madam, with that chair, I would answer any additional questions or thank you for the time. It sounds like we do have an additional question from Senator Settlemeyer. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, Chairman Yeager, I was just curious. I understand the desire to have a bright line test for the Gaming Control Board. And I was wondering if you'd be interested in expanding that out beyond just the discussion of nonprofits to also include all charitable organizations that are registered with the Secretary of State. That seems like a pretty easy, theoretically, the Secretary of State's office should be able to talk to the AG's office, at least I would hope. Uh, Steve Yeager, for the record, through you, Chair, to Senator Settlemeyer. Certainly willing to have that discussion. That's a new idea that's been brought up, so um, would like a chance to think about that. Uh, one of my concerns was simply what was noted, which was we need some kind of bright line test. So I think the Game and Control Board is not in the position of picking winners and losers and having to make that decision. So that very well may be an option. I'm open to consider that. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you so much, Chair Yeager. And, um, everybody else who participated. We will now close the hearing on AB202 and I will open the hearing on AB132. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, esteemed members of the Judiciary 
committee. Uh, I am Assemblyman Edgar Flores, for the record, proudly representing Assembly District 28. And I am here to present Assembly Bill 132. Alongside of me is Mr. John Pirro, who will provide some subject matter uh, testimony at the conclusion of my remarks. Uh, Madam Chair, if I just may offer a brief roadmap of how I intend for the conversation to proceed. I will quickly walk through the genesis of what this, uh, where this bill commenced, uh, address some of the concerns I have that I think are happening every day with our, uh, specifically our minors, uh, walk into how I believe this bill helps address that concern. I will then address slightly uh, a letter that was submitted by Dr. Olivares, who co-presented with me on the Senate, excuse me, on the Assembly side, but unfortunately had a commitment and was unable to be here in person. And then I'll hand over the presentation to Mr. Pirro so he can wrap it up and, and really tell you what he sees every day through his lens. So if I may, um, uh, Miranda versus Arizona is a 1966 landmark Supreme Court case um, wherein uh, we, we learned the very uh, famous Miranda warnings. Um, so prior to that, uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a whole host of things that were happening. Namely, uh, a lot of folks did not understand what protections uh, were extended to them. And through the Mir Miranda v. Arizona 1966 Supreme Court case, we got the, the very famous phrases of, you have the right to remain silent, anything you do can and will be used against you in the court of law, you have a right to an attorney. Uh, but one of the things that's often overlooked in that specific Supreme Court case, and probably the more important phrase, and what I want to focus this entire conversation on, is uh, the defendant may waive effectuation of these rights, provided that the waiver is made voluntarily, knowingly, and intelligently. That, those three words are, are, are the most important words in, in, in understanding the Miranda warning because I think that often folk, after the Miranda warning is read to them, do not waive their Miranda rights knowingly, intelligently. And, and, and that's where the genesis of this bill starts. And that's where we're gonna focus on. Um, if I could do a, a very quick shout out to uh, some, excuse me, Senator Orenshaw, um, as I know he's been a constant advocate for juvenile justice and, and ensuring that our minors have the protections that they deserve. Um, I would not have been working on this bill had it not been for Senator Orenshaw, so I just wanted to extend my gratitude for all his work and, and allowing me to, to work on this bill. Um, and, and I forgot to say this, but uh, to all, all the kids in the state of Nevada, this bill is specifically for you. Um, there is a, uh, since that 1966 Supreme Court uh, uh, law case, uh, we have had a whole host of Supreme Court cases wherein we've acknowledged that there are certain things that for a whole host of reasons included in the letter provided by Dr. Olivares that a minor does not necessarily understand exactly what they are doing. And, and that's important because what this bill seeks to do is expand what the Miranda warnings are now by making them a little bit easier to understand. And the language that you, f you see in, in Assembly Bill 132, um, I had an opportunity, and a big shout out to Cortez Elementary School, West Prep, um, because it, uh, I, I gave this language to them. And uh, West Prep, if you don't know, uh, they are K through 12, and Cortez is an elementary school, and I gave it to a bunch of teachers there that I have a friendship with, and I asked them to please read this language to their kids and, and, and provide some feedback. So anecdotally, they started giving me a bunch of feedback and, and they said that the kids, in comparing the two Miranda warnings, um, that this language that is in, in Assembly Bill 132 uh, seemed to uh, really uh, uh, go further into the understanding and comprehension of, of, of a child. And, and that's exactly what we wanted to make sure that, that this bill did. Um, if, I, if I could also just make it clear, we already limit in so many different ways what a, a, a person under the age of 18 can do. They can't enter into a binding contract. They can't go to a rated R film, right? They, they have to uh, seek parental consent to get married at a certain age. Uh, we limit at what time they can work. We tell them they can't vote. Purchasing alcohol, tobacco products. There is a whole host in, in the laundry list of what we tell minors they can and cannot do. And I think it's because collectively, as a country, as a society, we've decided that we have a responsibility ensuring that minors understand exactly what they're doing, and at times they don't. 
and that we go out of our way to create laws and protections so that we put it, that responsibility upon ourselves to create that safety net. And I say that because what, more, what is more important than our constitutional protections? And how often are minors waving away those rights, not understanding when they're saying, you have a right to an attorney, do you want to speak to somebody? Just put yourself in the, in the mindset of that child if they genuinely understand what's actually happening. Um, and if I may, I, I was going to walk you through a bunch of Supreme Court cases, but let's not do that. I, uh, I do have a brief synopsis. In the past 10 years, what the Supreme Court, excuse me, 15 years, what the Supreme Court uh, 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 case law has done. Um, so in, in the last 15 years, the United States Supreme Court has recognized the following. Children are generally less mature and responsible than adults, often lack the experience, perspective, and judgment to recognize and, and avoid choices that could be harmful to them. Children characteristically lack the capacity to exercise mature judgment and possess only an in incomplete ability to understand the world around them. Children are generally more vulnerable to outside influences than adults and have limited understanding of criminal justice system and the roles of the institutional actors within, within them. And, 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 I, and I, I read that out loud because we didn't come up with this language out of nowhere, and we didn't come up with this concept that it was just magically born. There is a whole host of case law that goes back for 15 years where we've made this acknowledgement that we understand that, that unfortunately children do not understand what's happening. I've always anecdotally uh, uh, shared, because I don't know if I have the data to prove it, but uh, I am a huge advocate for uh, the underrepresented communities, and I talk about the immigrant community a lot. And everybody always asks me, who do you think is the most disenfranchised community when it comes to access to, to the court, to due process? Who, who, who do we think collectively in, in the United States has the least amount of access to that? And I've always argued it's kids. Kids are, are in my opinion, who are often the most disenfranchised members of our community when it comes to, to access to, to uh, their constitutional protections to fight and advocate for themselves because the whole world around them is designed to be told what to do. Um, and with that, if I may, um, I'll walk you through the, the bill language now and express how I believe that this bill uh, helps address that concern and alleviate some of the frustrations that a lot of folk who work with kids in the juvenile justice system uh, have uh, concurred that unfortunately too often we see uh, uh, kids waving away their rights without necessarily understanding what's happening. So if I could walk you through, um, through the language itself, um, I specifically want to go into, I'm looking at section one, lines uh, six, seven, and eight of page one of the reprint. And it says, you have the right to remain silent, comma, which means you do not have to say anything to me unless you want to. It is your choice. Moving on to page two, lines one, through, through 10, if you choose to talk to me, whatever you tell me, I can tell a judge in court. You have the right to have your parent with you while you talk to me. You have the right to have a lawyer with you while you talk to me. If your family cannot pay for a lawyer, you will get a free lawyer. The lawyer is your lawyer and can help you if you decide that you want to talk to me. These are your rights. Do you understand what I have told you? Do you want to talk to me? Um, and this is, I guess, another way of seeing this is we're, we're taking the generic Miranda rights and then expanding on that. One of the questions that I'd like to preemptively uh, uh, address is somebody once told me, well, if Miranda v. Arizona uh, created a, a, rule, a set of rules of what the Miranda rights have to be, um, are we somehow violating constitutional law by expanding on them? And I just want to remind people that that set the floor but not the ceiling, right? That is the bare minimum of what we have to do, but we as a state can go above that and say we're gonna extend the, 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 the Miranda right a warning to ensure that we're, everybody's understanding it. Um, and with that, uh, Madam Chair, if I may hand over the presentation to Mr. John Pirro so he can give you real life examples of what he sees every day in his job. John Pirro for the record from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. And what we have noticed in our practice, although Assemblyman Flores has hit heavily on it, is that children going through the system do not have a strong grasp about what is happening, no matter how often our attorneys spend trying to explain the system. And to be quite frank with the committee, most adults don't have a clear understanding of what's going through the system. 
uh, well it's going on. I, I talk to a lot of clients uh, post case resolution when we're working on sealing their records and they're like, you know, I, I didn't fully understand what was going on. And I said, I, I wish you really would have told me then so I could have pressed pause and everything. What this is doing is providing protection on the front end for the child. Uh, as Assemblyman Flores has said, we protect children in all other aspects of the law. And I think it's time that we provide the appropriate protection uh, for our constitutional rights that we hold most sacred. Uh, the word I think to key on is intelli an intelligent waiver. And this warning here that Assemblyman For Flores has screened through both elementary school teachers and through Lexile testing to, to make sure we have age appropriate words that children can understand uh, provides that. And I'd be open for any questions. All right, questions from members of the committee? Senator Settlemeyer, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the education. I didn't realize until actually doing a quick Google search that <clears throat> the language presented from suspect to suspect can actually vary state to state, and that each state sometimes does have differences of how the wording, uh, no precise language is actually has to be used. But in that respect, if someone doesn't follow this verbatim, does that throw it all out? Or as long as I get the gist of this across, we're just trying to make it a little bit simpler to understand, and I appreciate that concept to the youth. But in that respect, if uh, let's say that if you're a youth officer and you actually catch somebody that's over 18 and they use this language, then the evidence is still admissible, and vice versa. If an officer sadly uses a more adult language, would that be still admissible? John Pirro for the record. So in, in some respects, Senator Settlemeyer, it, it may be litigated depending on how much it varied. But as the Supreme Court has said, there's no magic words, you know, but you, you do have to hit on the key concept so that it is knowing, it is voluntarily, it is intelligent when the waiver comes about. And, and so sometimes that issue is litigated um, if, if it was that far of a departure. But it's been my experience that um, officers, at least with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, the North Las Vegas Police Department, Henderson Department, have pre-printed cards. And when the federal district court in the state of Nevada ruled that their current waiver that they were using, and this is February, maybe a few years ago, was uh, unacceptable. They immediately changed their cards and, and went to using the cards. And then in their report, they would be like, revise this date. So I imagine that they would pre-print cards with this and then read from this as well. Okay, and I appreciate that. In that respect, what would happen in a situation, though, where you don't necessarily know the right age of the person? is where my concern comes in. So you think the person is 16, in all actuality they're 18. If you use this on a 19-year-old, you're still okay, correct? And vice versa, just in case someone's not real good at judging somebody's age, because I can tell you I am not. John Pirro, for the record, you'd probably be better than okay with this, because this is a very understandable version. So you'd actually be probably safer using this for adults. And if I may just put a quick plug, I know that the state has no money, but other states have studied the rates of dyslexia in prison and the jail, and they're absurdly high. And most of the adults that come through our office, sixth grade reading level or lower. So you, this is actually much better for everybody's understanding, but definitely moving that way for children. Okay. Thank you. And, Thank you, Chair. And Madam Chair, if I may, Assembly Medical Force for the record, and I appreciate that question. Um, and the Supreme Court uh, did address a very similar question in 2011, JDB versus North Carolina. Uh, in that Supreme Court case, there was a minor um, who had some special needs, uh, approximately age 13, and he was taken back to the school after being home. Um, and the, the question came down to, was it a custodial interrogation or did he you know, voluntarily be, uh, show up and, and participate and give the information? And I know uh, Justice Sotomayor in that specific ruling said, it's beyond dispute that children will often feel bound to submit to police questioning when an adult in the same circumstances would feel free to leave. Seeing no reason for police officers or courts to blind themselves to that common sense reality, we hold that a child's uh, age properly informs the Miranda custody analysis. So there is absolutely going to be scenarios where uh, whether or not there was a proper Miranda warning reading to, to, to that ch child will be litigated. I mean, it's, it's, it's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, and, and, and that's not the intent. Uh, and I think law enforcement will attest to this, that at the beginning, they'll very likely just carry a little card and how to, you know, how old are you once they, they recognize that they're under the age of 18. 
they'll be reading off of that little card as often they do that now. Even though they have it memorized, they just always have it on them. But uh, law enforcement can, can go further into that. No, I appreciate that. I, I see a situation if this is actually more acceptable, I would just assume the cops would just carry the simplest version, period, regardless. Thank you. I think we also have a, sorry, did, did you have a question, Senator Orenshaw? More of a comment, if that's okay, Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I just want to compliment Edgar Flores on this innovative approach to try to help children. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people uh, think of, you know, children being arrested and think of, uh, you know, graffiti, petty larceny. But, uh, you know, we have juveniles up at the Lovelock Correctional Center who, uh, you know, are there, were sentenced as adults. So these rights are so important to kids because, uh, you know, no one can really be sure when that initial arrest happens where where that path may lead and whether the case will stay in juvenile court or whether there'll be uh, an attempt to transfer it over to adult court and the consequences of adult court and adult prison which is a different system based on a different model than juvenile court so i think anything like this that helps children try to understand their rights in that uh, scary situation when they're they're in custody and under arrest uh, may you know just change a lot of kids lives for the better. So I really do appreciate the bill and thank you. Thank you. And Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. Quick comment. Um, Mr. Pirro mentioned we protect children under all other aspects of the law, but actually the most disenfranchised, disenfranchised group are the unborn. And there's a certain assemblywoman who would love to have a co-sponsor on her a bill on parental notification. So just want to get that on the record real quick. Now to the actual bill. The question of, do you understand what I have told you? What if the answer no? John Pirro, for the record, then it's probably time to call in a lawyer to make sure that the child can understand the rights before they waive the rights. So at that point, the cop just says, look, you don't understand. The, 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 the only question I've got in this whole concept is it's almost like if, if, a, if a minor is, is incapable of really making a good judgment call regardless, why don't... We just strike the ability to have any kind of interrogation prior to arrest. Just so say, look, you, you can't talk to kids under the age of 18 if you're a cop or whatever. John Pierre, for the record, the bill actually started out that way. Oh, Senator Hansen, and, and oh. this is where we wound up where people could accept it. I got it. Well, that's how the process works, so I, I got it. But, but, yeah, it just seems to me, you know, we, we are kind of schizophrenic when it comes to what you can and can't do when it comes to underage people. And while I am being uh, not totally facetious about the unborn, you know, you can be 12 years old and you can go get an abortion, and nobody knows about it but you and the doctor. But that same 12-year-old, if a cop dares to ask him a question about, hey, do you steal that candy bar? Technically, he could be, if he doesn't do this warning, assuming we pass it, uh, the cop could, you know, whatever evidence he gathers gets thrown out. But, so I don't know, sometimes I wonder, I, the whole 18-year-old thing, I, I've got the whole, I just had LCB do it again for me because we've got an issue coming up on this. And it's surprising how many, you can, you can go in the Army and drive a tank at the age of 18. The kids charging the beach at Iwo Jima are often 18. Yet you can't buy a cigarette when, when, when you're 18, you know. So there's a lot of weird anomalies in our law. But I, frankly, I, I think this concept is good. I'm just kind of wondering, now that I understand you guys actually originally went to the degree that it seems logical to go to, if we're going to assume at that age they just don't make wise decisions. So thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, Senator Pickard. Uh, thank you, Chair Scheibel. Um, uh, I... I you know, it's interesting when we redid uh, or we created uh, NRCP uh, or the Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure 16215, which was the uh, uh, judicial interviewing of children. Uh, one of the things we talked about actually was uh, Justice Sotomayor's comment, uh, which is, I think, spot on, that children simply don't understand. Uh, and and uh, Mr. Pirro, to your point, if adults aren't understanding, then the children certainly won't. And so um, uh, while I'm perfectly supportive of this, um, I, I'm just wondering, are we, did, was this just uh, a, uh, an effort on your part to simplify language, or did the language come from somewhere that has been vetted and, and tested uh, empirically? Thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, Madam Chair, through you to uh, Senator Pickard, Assembly Manager Flores, for the record. So the, the, the quick answer is it has been vetted. Uh, Kings County in Washington um, has a, a very similar Miranda warning reading for anyone under the age of 18. Um, and we had an opportunity to reach out and speak to some folk. In fact, um, and I don't know if she'll be coming up, but I, I know our, some of our public defenders 
uh, went as far as to reach out to uh, uh, other public defenders out there and judges to get some feedback and some perspective from them. And I will say, uh, going back to Senator Hansen's question, uh, there are other states presently that do not allow for a minor to waive away their, uh, uh, their right uh, to an attorney. Uh, in fact, if there's, if there's going to be a custodial interrogation, an attorney must be present. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not there anymore. We're, we're at a different place with this bill. Um, but, but so, uh, in short, we have had the opportunity to, not Nevada, but through a different state, see how it played out. All right, I appreciate that. So it, it sounds then like uh, we may have some data to show uh, uh, that this meets a certain minimum level of, of understanding um, because obviously children are on a, a fairly uh, steep learning curve. Uh, you know, 15-year-olds will understand a whole lot more than a 14-year-old. Um, um, but there's data to support that the average uh, youth that's going to be picked up is going to understand this or... Or uh, at, at what point do we, you know, kind of hit that tipping point? John Pirro for the record. Senator Pickard, uh, Ms. Birch is going to come up. She's going to talk about the Kings County uh, reach out that happened where they're currently using similar language. All right. Very good. I'll, I'll reserve for her then. Thank you very much. All right. If there are not other questions, I have a, a couple of questions. And um, you had mentioned that you ran this language by some elementary school teachers who ran it by their kids, which I think is brilliant. And I love that method of vetting it because um, my legal understanding of Miranda is that the Miranda warning has to conform with the Constitution. And there are certain parameters that have to be met within the Constitution. Within those boundaries, it is up to an individual peace officer uh, to determine how they communicate those Miranda warnings. And in most jurisdictions like in Las Vegas, po entire departments adopt policies that are uh, across the board consistent with that. But there's nothing in law that prevents an officer from, I mean, things in policy, but nothing in law that prevents an officer from giving a different warning as long as it meets those constitutional standards. And there are, in fact, times when we litigate those, when an officer doesn't have their card on them and they do their best to recite the right rights, or I've seen cases where officers get interrupted and repeat a portion but not another portion or miss a sentence and either do or don't go back to it. So my point being that really the, the standard to which the language is to be held doesn't have to do with the person who you are talking to, but it has to do with whether or not it meets the constitutional requirements of Miranda. And so what you're doing in this bill is further um, refining that language to make sure that it is understandable to a particular group of people, and in this case, kids. And so you mentioned that you had compared this language to other warning language. I was just wondering if that was the current Metro juvenile warning or the current Metro adult warning or a different warning altogether. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for that question. Assembly Member Flores, for the record. Um, uh, we used, so uh, CCSD had provided us some language. Uh, they, they, they do something I believe is called the Miranda Plus uh, uh, warning. And I, I believe Clark County School District may be, or somebody from the school district may be here, I'm not sure. But um, I, I saw their language, and that's the language I used. Right, that's the language that's reflected in the bill, or that's the language that you compared it that's to? That's the language I compared it to. Okay, and the, the kids found this language that's currently in the bill to be easier to understand. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, some medical floors for the record. Yeah, the feedback that we got from the teachers was that they understood this better. And uh, one of our teachers, who's amazing, they, they went as far as doing a, a role play, and, and they just created a, a hypothetical, played around, and then to see if the kids would say yes or no. And at the end, a lot of them were like, no, I'd rather wait, you know? Again, I, I love that method. So I, I just have two more questions. Um, the first one is about the, the term parent. Um, and I'm not sure about the, the law for juveniles, if, um, it, if they really only have the right to have a parent present or if it could be another guardian or adult with some kind of legal authority. I'm not sure that it, that it requires an amendment to the bill because I understand we're trying to make this understandable for kids. I'm just hoping that we can get some legislative history on the record as to what, what the law is and why we've chosen this language. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Ch Chairwoman. Again, Assemblyman Edgar Flores, for the record. Um, in conversations with different stakeholders involving law enforcement, the county, uh, and the school district, uh, the, some of the feedback we got, and, and, and fortunately, I will look it up as we're speaking. Like, I don't have the exact citation. There is a, a Nevada Supreme Court case on point uh, wherein this very specific conversation was had as to whether a child had, had the right to have their parent present. Uh, the ruling was that they do, um, and based on that is why we have the inclusion of this particular language here. But I can get you that exact citation, and then we can put that on the record. I would appreciate that. And just to clarify, what I'm imagining is a kid who hears this warning and lives with grandma or grandpa, and they say you have a right to have a parent present, and they think, oh, well, my mom and dad aren't around, and so they're just quiet instead of saying, what about grandma? So that, that's where my question stems from. And um, my final question is about language barriers. Um, I assume this would just fall into all of the other case law that has been decided about ensuring that people have access to um, information in their in a language that they understand and um, I'm just hoping that you can assure me that this falls into that category and we're not going to be you know missing a loophole I don't want to say loophole because it's not like people are going to intentionally avoid this but mi uh, we're not going to be having a gap for kids who are not uh, proficient in English John Piero for the record chair I, I think that'll be covered. I, I think Metro does a good job of, of examining those issues and will probably lead the way. Okay, great. Thank you all. Any other questions? Not seeing questions. So we will go to testimony in support of AB 132. It sounds like Ms. Birchie is going to join us first at the table. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee. Kendra Burgey with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office for the record. I'll first start with a question from Senator Pickard. Um, starting from the last legislative session where Senator Orangel had brought a bill where we discussed the um, possibility of engaging in what some of the other states are doing and expanding their Miranda warnings specifically for juveniles. Um, I began to research this issue. I would just also note that Senator Scheibel was involved, involved in those conversations, so I do appreciate her work on this as well. Uh, we reached out to NCJ FCJ with Joey Arduna Hastings, who connected me with not only the public defender's offices around several jurisdictions, but also judges and former judges, where we landed on what seems to be the model in several states is that King County uh, Miranda warnings. I would just note that they were actually initiated by the King County Sheriff's Office in collaboration with the Department of Public Defense and a nonprofit that works with children called Creative Justice. So these were carefully vetted Miranda warnings. And as you heard, then we researched that within our own state. So that's kind of the genesis of these Miranda warnings. Harvard Medical School also studied Miranda warnings across the country. And so just to add to what you heard, they found that when they looked at the Miranda warnings for throughout all the different jurisdictions, that 52% of the warnings required someone to have at least an eighth grade level of reading comprehension. And then when someone's arrested, their understanding and comprehension is reduced by 20%. So that's the need for these warnings. Um, as to Senator Settlemeyer's question regarding the differences, um, I can let the committee know I had the privilege of uh, of going along on a ride along with the Washoe County Sheriff's Department this past week, weekend where the officer did just read from the card. And I do hope that they would, even if they didn't know the age, would read the juvenile Miranda warnings because they do provide the additional clarity. They don't change the constitutional mandates, but do help ensure that everyone understands what they're agreeing or not agreeing to. They're huge constitutional rights that they're either asserting or waiving. In 2010, the ABA passed a resolution urging governments to develop simple worded Miranda warnings, and we believe that this does exactly that. Just to pro provide some addition additional information, Sheriff John Urquhart from the King County Sheriff's Department said that these are simple, comprehensive language designed to ensure children know their rights when they make that knowing and voluntary decision. He said, criminal convictions have much larger and longer impacts than a possible jail sentence. We want to help youth succeed. 
That's why we're asking them to help us solve crimes, while at the same time we are working harder to protect their rights. And we hope you will join in that effort to protect their rights. Thank you. All right, I see Senator Pickard has a question, and I will allow him to ask that question if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I, I just want to make sure that um, uh, it, this was the same. That my concern is this, that so often, as was mentioned, the child is going to say, uh, you know, yes, I'm, I'm you know, when a, a, particularly those that have been raised to, to respect and adhere to authority. Um, and they're, they're asked, are you willing to do, are you willing to talk, after all this, are you willing to talk to me? Um, many of them are just going to reflectively say yes, and now they're subject to the interrogation. So uh, what I hear you saying, and I just want to confirm, is that the King County and the other jurisdictions that have adopted like uh, language have found that these younger children, uh, even though they're only at, at, or operating on an 80% comprehension basis, that they're understanding that this means they can say no and they'll be safe. Is, is that accurate? Kendra Birchie, for the record, through you, Chair Scheibel, to Senator, or Senator Pickard. I can't say that specifically because King County does have additional assurances as well. I will note that the studies show that 90% of our youth just waive their rights. And it's discussed that the reason for that is because they don't understand that. I can let you know that our office had the position when this bill first started that we needed to require that an attorney be present in order to ensure that the child understood their rights. We were willing to do that. Unfortunately, um, that didn't make it part of this bill. So I can't answer that in the affirmative or the negative just because those other jurisdictions had that additional safeguard to ensure that children understood their rights. All right. Thank you. All right. Is there anybody else present? We have someone else present to give testimony in support of AB 132. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Scheibel and committee members. For the record, Liz Davenport, L-I-Z-D-A-V-E-N-P-O-R-T, the Boyd Law intern for the ACLU of Nevada here in support of AB 132. Thank you, Assemblyman Flores, for bringing this bill. Children are our most vulnerable population and we must protect their right to due process when they are most at risk of being caught in the incarceration machine. Echoing Assemblyman Flores, children are uniquely vulnerable and often placed in a protected class because of this. They do not have fully developed brains and are predisposed to be obedient to police because of their authority figure status, as Senator Pickard was describing. Children are more easily intimidated and have a natural dependency upon adults and therefore are recognized as having a high susceptibility to any police coercion, no matter how slight. In some jurisdictions, as many as 80 to 90% of children waive their right to an attorney because they do not understand the word waive. A study in the medical journey law and human behavior that has been numerously cited shows that children are more susceptible and more likely than adults to make decisions that reflect a propensity to comply with authority figures. The ACLU of Nevada supports AB 132 to enable children to more easily understand their Miranda warnings as a first step in the direction to protecting children's due process rights. Thank you and we urge your support. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else in person? All right, um, we will then move to testimony via phone in support of AB 132. Each person will have two minutes. Um, if we could get the first person in line, please, Mr. Kyle. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 132, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in support on Assembly Bill 132, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 130. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. And I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada here in support of AB 132. 
We believe that all youth should have access to the resources and information they need to navigate the criminal justice system, regardless of the severity of the charges. Provisions in AB 132 will help increase fairness and better ensure justice for youth in Nevada. We urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, caller. A brief reminder, if you've recently joined us, we are currently on support testimony for Assembly Bill 132. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 080, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hi, Jim Hoffman, representing Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice. NACJ supports AB 132. It's simple common sense that kids need a lot of things explained to them that might be obvious to adults. Why wouldn't that extend to Miranda warnings? The purpose of Miranda warnings is to make sure that people are not tricked or coerced accidentally or on purpose into testifying against themselves. And that policy rationale applies with special force to children. Practical experience bears out the need for this kind of specialized warning, and so NACJ supports this bill. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 741. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. My name is Paul Kappa, that's spelled C-A-T-H-A, and I represent the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. The Culinary Union supports Assembly Bill 132 because it furthers the fulfillment of the constitutionally protected rights for all children in Nevada, regardless of background. The Culinary Union represents 60,000 working families in Nevada. A majority of members are people of color and tens of thousands are parents. We know that there are significant racial disparities in the outcomes of our legal system, and that's why we must standardize and streamline the juvenile judicial process, which will result in more just legal outcomes. AB 132 is a common sense fix that will aid in the fulfillment of children's constitutional rights. As the largest organization of parents in Nevada, the Culinary Union urges the Nevada legislature to support and pass AB 132. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 229. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. Jamie Rodriguez, that's J-A-M-I-E-R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z. I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Washoe County, um, and here today in support of AB 132 on behalf of our Juvenile um, Justice Division in Washoe County. Uh, we're very appreciative of the Assemblyman and the work to help um, with the amended version that addressed a lot of our concerns with the bill as drafted. Um, and as uh, now in front of you today in reprint one, we believe is a positive step forward to helping youth in our um, communities that may fall under the uh, criminal justice system and are in full support of the bill as drafted. Thank you so much. Thank you, caller. For those of you that just joined us, we are currently on support testimony for Assembly Bill 132. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 147, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the Senate Judiciary. This is Bridget Duffy, B-R-I-G-I-D. D-U-S-S-Y, Chief of the Juvenile Division for the Clark County District Attorney's Office, here today on behalf of the Nevada District Attorney's Association in support of AB 132. We'd like to thank Assemblyman Flores for working with me on the amendments to get us into the support uh, level of this bill. It is my belief that AB 132 is a developmentally appropriate Miranda for children who have contact with law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And with that, Chair, there are no more callers to provide a support testimony at this time. All right. We will move to testimony in opposition to AB 132. I don't see anybody in the room to give testimony, so we will go to the phones. Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 132, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 132, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue.
And Chair, at this time, there are no callers to provide opposition testimony. All right, we will take testimony in the neutral position on AB 132. Don't see anybody in the room to give testimony, so we will go to uh, broadcast, please. Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 132, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 132, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair, at this time, there are no callers to provide neutral testimony. All right, then. I'll invite the sponsor back up if you have any closing comments. And if not, that's fine, too. We will close the hearing on AB 132. Thank you all for your time and attention. And we will move on to AB 42. I will now open the hearing on AB 42. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Scheibel, members of the committee. My name is Nicole Rourke. I am the Director of Government and Public Affairs for the City of Henderson, and I'm here today along with my colleague Mark Skifalakwa to present AB 42. This bill addresses a need to establish the statutory authority for municipal courts to conduct jury trials. Historically, municipal and justice courts have not, con uh, have not conducted jury trials here in Nevada. However, as a result of a statutory change in 2015 and a subsequent Nevada Supreme Court decision, municipal courts are now tasked with conducting jury trials in cases involving misdemeanor battery domestic violence. In 2015, the legislature amended NRS 202.360 through the passage of SB 175 to include a misdemeanor of domestic violence in the list of crimes where a conviction prohibits the person from owning or possessing a firearm. As a result of this change, the Nevada Supreme Court released the decision on Anderson versus the 8th Judicial Court in the city of Las Vegas on September 12, 2019, which deemed misdemeanor domestic battery under state law a serious offense under the Sixth Amendment and thus defendants are entitled to a jury trial. This presents a challenge for our municipal courts without specific authority granted in statute. The Henderson Municipal Court alone processes approximately 1,000 domestic violence cases each year and establishing authority to conduct jury trials will allow these courts to invest in the infrastructure necessary to move forward with meeting the obligations established by Anderson. With that, I'll turn my time over to Mark Skifalakwa, our, our city's chief prosecutor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee. Mark Skifalakwa, M-A-R-C-S-C-H-I-F-A-L-A-C-Q-U-A. There's no doubt that Anderson was a huge decision, uh, but it also left some huge questions unanswered, and that's what we're here for today, to fix those problems and questions that lingered from the decision. Here are some of the issues that have come up uh, since the Anderson decision was uh, decided. The first and the most glaring is, are municipal courts allowed to conduct jury trials now? As you all know, typically cities uh, get their authority from a few sources, statutes, maybe their charter, or the Constitution, none of which directly say municipalities can conduct jury trials. It's certainly implied in the Anderson decision, which was a municipal court case, actually, but it doesn't come out and say that. And then also, we've never had the history in Nevada of doing jury trials in municipal courts, so our courts just aren't outfitted for those jury trials. Uh, there's no jury boxes. We don't have a jury um, you know, commissioner. We don't have personnel. So can we invest in and get these going? And what rules do we follow? Now, our rules for jury trials in this state are in Chapter 175, and you won't see the word municipal court in there. So we need to know what rules to follow, so we're all doing this the same way. Now, onto that first question of can we do these, these jury trials? I have always argued yes uh, since the Anderson decision. The Anderson decision is based on the Sixth Amendment. We're operating a criminal court. Obviously, you can comply with the Constitution. I've been relying on this case uh, in my arguments throughout the various courts I've had to argue this in front of. This is Donahue versus Sparks. 
a Sparks Municipal Court judge in 1994 ordered a jury trial for a DUI, and that was challenged. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court of our state says you really can't do that, Municipal Court. You can't just order it because you want it. Uh, absent a constitutional uh, ruling or a constitution to comply with constitutional law. So we've been dealing with that. So after Anderson, clearly we have a constitutional rule that says we can, can do these, and that's what we've been, what we've been doing. But again, the attacks on our ability to be able to provide this due process right have been nonstop. They were immediate. Um, we've been litigating that ever since. Here are three district court cases from the 8th Judicial District Court, uh, two Henderson and one Las Vegas. Three different district court judges, they've all agreed with us though, with the prosecution, that yes, clearly this is a constitutional ruling and you can comply with that. I will say though, these are all um, in various stages of briefing to the Supreme Court. Uh, there has not been a decision on any of these cases, nor do I expect there to be one by the end of the session. And so that's what's really hampered us in, in moving forward, all these attacks. But it's a little more than that. Uh, this is 1988, Blanton versus North Las Vegas Municipal Court. And this is our Supreme Court saying, it was a challenge uh, to a DUI, saying, hey, we, the defendant said I wanted a jury trial for a DUI. They've, they said that they, they did not get one, uh, but they also went on to say, listen, even if we rule that you do, uh, you really can't do these until the legislature is in session. Uh, it's not on the Supreme Court to provide the rules about how to proceed on these cases, uh, how many peremptory challenges, um, you know, making sure everything's uniform. That's not something the Supreme Court's going to give us. So the Supreme Court has already said, even if we order it, don't think you're doing these until uh, you get some rules from the legislature. And if you recall, this decision came out right at the end of the last session, uh, September 2019. So we were being challenged about our authority. We didn't have any rules. As Ms. Work mentioned, there's a thousand victims about a year that we handle in our court. Now, countywide, just taking North Las Vegas, Las Vegas, and Henderson, almost 7,000 cases of misdemeanor domestic violence, way more than the Clark County District Attorney's Office, Public Defender's Office, and Justice Court handle. So just theoretically, handing him over would never have worked. These are our victims, this was our problem, and we have a duty to them. And as you know, there was a whole lot of time between September 2019 and May 5th of 2021. So what the cities, the three largest cities in Clark County did was enact a domestic violence ordinance with similar penalties, enhancement capabilities. It doesn't carry the gun prohibition, uh, which is how you get around doing, not doing the jury trials. This was meant as a, uh, a stopgap measure. Uh, I've said this publicly since September of 2019. Uh, it was to get us to here. Uh, we want to go forward. We want to do these trials, um, but we need to prote protection and rules to do so. And that's why we're here. Uh, this is a very tough problem. This is one of the tougher problems that the judiciary has, it has dealt with in some time, uh, but it's not an impossible problem. Uh, we can do this. So the bill is to give clear language that we can provide this right, give us the rules so we know we're all doing this uh, uniformly, and then lastly, to provide a clear definition in the, uh, uh, of the gun prohibition law, which is not very clear right now, and so we know exactly who's prohibited, who's not, and who gets this jury trial and who doesn't. There's various parts of this bill that just talk about what I said. They talk about the authority, they talk about the rules. Certainly happy to ask or answer any questions on those. Uh, it changes a lot of the language, inserts the word municipal court into 175, so we're following those rules. Um, tells us how to pay the jurors, all these type of things. Um, but again, that's a lot of conformity uh, just to make sure we can comply. But I'll just touch on two parts uh, that are a little more substantive. One, the size of the jury. How many jurors do we need for a misdemeanor jury trial in the state of Nevada? Um, in 1983, the 1983 legislative session added in a section that said you can do six for a misdemeanor. You can do six jurors. Um, it provided a statutory right at that point, but there was never a constitutional right. And frankly, there's really never been misdemeanor jury trials until 
last year. So it was really a dormant law for the last 30 to 40 years. So I wanted to look into it, make sure we're good to go with six. The U.S. Supreme Court says you can do six under the federal constitution. But there's been many states that have struck down their six-person jury statutes. And I looked into those about why. This is our constitution on jury trials. Article 1, Section 3. The right of a trial by jury shall be secured to all and remain inviolate forever. I'll be honest, I didn't know exactly what that meant, and so I had to research it. It means perpetual. It means enduring. It means whatever the framers who wrote that, whatever they meant in 1864, when our Constitution was adopted, it's got to mean the same today. We can't alter it. Okay, so what? We found the debates of our Constitutional Convention in 1864 for our state of Nevada. Now, as you know, a state constitution can always provide more rights than the federal constitution. The question is, in our state, does it provide 12 or does it provide 6? This is one of the delegates. Such sacred rights as life and liberty should be carefully guarded and not allowed to be put in jeopardy by anything less than the unanimous ver verdict of 12 of a man's peers, that unless the jury of 12 and partial men all agree that he's guilty, that he shall not face various punishments. So there was talk in our Constitution Convention, and they said 12 when interpreting uh, Article 1, Section 3, so the inviolate language. There's also a couple cases uh, in Nevada that have decided this. Uh, they're old, but they are around the time that our Constitution was adopted. Borowski versus State, 1876. The right to a trial by jury means the right to be tried by 12 impartial jurors. They should be impartial is just as essential to the Constitution as the jury as they should be 12 in number. And that was a misdemeanor case in 1876. State versus McClear, also 1876, also a body of 12 men. Um, to be perfectly clear with everyone, um, we would want six. This is going to be hard enough on everybody. And most of our buildings are not made for jurors, juries at all. And so when you have 12, it's just, it's tougher because you have space concerns. And I fully understand that. I also understand that we, I've been litigating this issue for the last two years. And many cases have been put on hold during that time for the Supreme Court to weigh in. And I have no interest in doing that again on another constitutional issue. Every state that I looked at that writes their constitution like ours has said you have to have 12. Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Kansas, Idaho, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. And although, like I said, this is not the conclusion I want, it is the conclusion I came to, so I wanted to, des to describe why. And then the second part I just wanted to highlight is the gun prohibition law. And that's the whole reason why we had Anderson. In 2015, we added in domestic violence, that that makes you a prohibited person from owning or possession, possessing guns in Nevada. And so we wanted to take a look at that. Currently, and I put it up there, obviously in, in red is the, uh, the current language, but this is the proposed change. We define it not based on Nevada law, but federal law. So how the federal law defines domestic violence. Now that's run into trouble when we're talking about this issue. Um, here's why. Under the federal law, it prohibits a few people um, from only possessing guns if they're convicted. Spouses, former spouses, if you have a child in common, parent, child, or anybody similarly situated to those groups. So similarly situated to a spouse or a parent. Um, now, the issue there is most, I wouldn't say most, but a large uh, portion of our cases deal with dating relationships. There's something called the boyfriend loophole in the federal gun law. Well, that's what it is. It doesn't include your general dating relationships. So we have currently in Nevada a husband abusing his wife and is convicted of that. That person is prohibited from having a firearm going forward. We have the same abusive relationship, but let's, well now we have boyfriend abusing girlfriend. 
That person is not prohibited in the state of Nevada. Um, we see a high level of violence in these dating relationships, and so certainly we think it's a good policy uh, to close that loophole. Most states that uh, have their own state gun prohibition have done so. But also there's a practical reason to this. Um, when we pick up a police report and it says that the parties have been dating six months, we are not going to know, by and large, if they meet the federal definition. You know, are they similarly situated to a spousal relationship? Who knows? I, I don't know if they're sharing bills. I don't know if they're in a monogamous relationship. But we know they're dating. And again, the right to the jury trial is attached to the gun prohibition. If you could have your guns taken away upon conviction, you get this level of due process. That's Anderson. So we need to know clearly who's in and who's out. And right now, nobody knows who's in and who's out. There's also another problem. There's this Hayes case out of the US Supreme Court. It's interpreting the federal gun law. And what it says is, you could be convicted of a lesser offense and still be prohibited federally. So simple battery, simple assault, simple coercion. Um, and so then we would have to provide jury trials to, to those individuals as well. And we want to keep this very clear. This is for the crime of battery domestic violence. You have to be charged with that. You have to be convicted of that. That's the way to be uh, prohibited in Nevada. Um, we don't want and are not seeking to rope in a bunch of other crimes that maybe nobody intended somebody to be prohibited for. Overall, we're just looking to clarify who gets the jury trial at the outset, who doesn't. Uh, another issue is the federal definition can always change, as you know. Uh, there's various bills in Congress right now to change it. Um, if we rely on that, it could change in a way we like, it could change in a way we don't like, and we may not have much of a, a voice until the next session. And it would close the boyfriend uh, loophole, which we do think would provide greater um, protection for victims. Thank you very much, and I'm certainly open for any questions. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It's wonderful to have you here, uh, Mr. skiff and his work. Uh, Senator Harris. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. Um, my first question is about the stopgap that you've put into place. Is it my understanding that if this legislation is passed, that ordinance will no longer be operative? Uh, through the chair to you, Senator. Um, it will still be operative, but I want to be clear, you would be prohibited for getting, you would get a jury trial under the ordinance going forward. And the reason why is we included under the, the new definition of the gun prohibition that it's a violation of state law or any other jurisdiction has kind of the same law. We have the same law. So whatever one we chose to, it, it, it really probably what doesn't make a difference either way. You're going to get the jury trial either way. Okay, that makes sense. Um, uh, and my, my second question is about uh, Section 13. And it looks like here on, uh, let's see, line 38, you have the parent or legal guardian of the person. Is, it, is that intended to capture juveniles or is it also intended to apply to the adult guardianship relationship? Thank you, Senator, uh, through you, Mark Skifalakwa. Uh, it is, starting with just the, the parent child, let's say biological parent, biological child, yes, it would apply going forward, meaning when both are adults. Okay, so it would certainly apply for the defendant hitting the ch a child who was under the age, but also a 40-year-old hitting a 20-year-old. That, that would qualify. Um, the legal guardian language, that's actually already in the federal uh, the definition, so I, I, I put it here, but that being said, that wouldn't be much of a change. Uh, we're really looking for people in that parental type of role. So if I have this right, what you're looking for is like the parent of the person or legal guardian of a child. Mark Skifalakwa, yes. Okay. As currently drafted, it seems this would apply to someone who has a guardianship of the estate of an adult or uh, guardianship of a person or a person and a state, right? So it seems this is sweeping in uh, that adult guardianship process. And if it's your intention to carve that out, then I think there may be an amendment that would need to be put forth. Thank you, Senator Mark Skifalakwa. 
yes, it is really meant to apply to the parent-child relationship. Now that, like I said, the parent-child relationship will go on other than when someone's a minor. But yes, I understand. Thank you. Other questions from members of the committee? Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you both for bringing the bill. Um, and I appreciate our uh, offline conversation we had before. I want to just explore that uh, 6 versus 12 um, uh, juror uh, question. Um, after our conversation, I looked up the uh, Borowski case, uh, which I, it was interesting because it had to do with public administrators uh, uh, that um, uh, violate the law and thus are subject to misdemeanor. Um, and in that case, they, uh, or the Supreme Court, the Nevada Supreme Court, allowed for or uh, stated that a person could consent to fewer than 12. And so uh, I thought it interesting that, uh, particularly when we look at uh, um, statutory construction and interpretation of constitutional law, um, one of the canons suggests that we are allowed, uh, as a legislature, um, uh, to uh, deviate so long as we're not contrary to the Constitution. And the Constitution, although in the Borowski case, they state that uh, the law knows no number other than 12, similarly, the Constitution doesn't require 12 for misdemeanor uh, convictions. And so uh, wouldn't it be true that if we, um, as a legislature, post Borowski and all the history that has, has ensued, uh, particularly in light of the Anderson case, uh, we are at liberty to uh, state a six-member jury uh, is sufficient in these cases. Thank you, Senator. To the chair, to you, Mark Skifalakwa. The question is, is the word 12 embedded in the word and violate to, this, to the degree that we can't make a law that goes against this? I certainly don't have a crystal ball, but I will say that the other states that have looked at it with similar history and similar language have said no, uh, you couldn't do it absent a constitutional amendment. All right, and so uh, uh, on that uh, interpretation then, uh, it's my understanding then that uh, if we're going to uh, do this, we're going to be impaneling uh, 12 uh, jury, juries. Uh, sorry, it's hard to talk with a mask on. Uh, we will be impaneling 12 juror juries, uh, which then what kind of uh, um, accommodations are we going to have to make? I mean, uh, besides just the obvious creating the jury box, you hinted at jury commissioners and the like. Um, uh, what kind of uh, impact is this going to have on the uh, justice courts and municipal courts uh, that are hearing domestic violence cases that don't have the benefit of... Uh, uh, the uh, Henderson ordinance uh, at, at, at what point you know what are we forcing everybody to do in this case thank you senator the chair to you mark skifalakwa there's no question this is difficult uh, the main issue is space frankly and expense uh, when you have more jurors you need more room uh, you need more room in the courtroom you need more room in a jury facility to, to, to call the initial pool in. And you need to summon a, a wider net. You need more people to show up. Uh, so there's no question um, that there is an added expense from 6 to 12. I will say the statute does allow, uh, along with the Borowski case, the parties can agree to less. Uh, I will almost always agree to less if the other side will allow it. Uh, but... Um, Again, that's why it's, it's difficult, and I don't see this necessarily as a discretionary thing. I wish it was, um, but it, perhaps uh, my mind will be changed at some point. It just hasn't, uh, given all the states that have looked at it. Um, oh, other than that, though, yes, it's, it's the space, it's the summons, and it's the room itself. And then uh, it, if this bill passes, uh, how long do you think it'll take for at least the city of Henderson uh, to prepare for that? Thank you, Senator Mark Skiflockwood, to you uh, through the chair. At least six months, and that's why we gave ourselves some time uh, before this would be fully enacted and fully in law. Um, there's probably a short-term plan and a long-term plan we'll have to do. Short-term, maybe some folding chairs and trying to uh, figure out a different space to call the jury pool into. Uh, but that being said, then we would need to do construction, and that's more of a long-term plan. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, are there other questions from, go ahead, Senator Settlemeyer. Thank you, Chair, I appreciate that. I was just referring to page seven, the discussion 
the reasoning of the pop cap, so it would only be the larger cities that would be able to potentially take advantage of this, am I correct? Thanks, Senator Marks. If I walk right through the chair to you. Uh, no, uh, so this would be the, lar the larger cities uh, could summons their jury pool from their cities themselves. They wouldn't have to go countywide. But if you're under the population cap, you can send your summonses out countywide. We also worked with the uh, Justice of the Pieces on this. Um, so that there's something similar with their townships. If they have a small township, they could go countywide, not just to the, the barriers of their township. I appreciate that explanation. If I could have another question. Thank you, Chair. I was just curious. I understand the concept of not, not wanting to have all the federal rules directly listed as far as word for word, but would there be an objection to the concept of just referring to the federal rules in order to make it easier to understand from state to state and just make it more applicable? Uh, Mark Skifalakwa, uh, through the chair to you, Senator. Are you, I apologize to ask a clarifying question. Are you talking about the gun prohibition section Correct. itself? Okay, thank you. Um, it, the, the, the issue that if we do that, the concern is roping in all these other crimes that we don't want people to be prohibited for or to give them a jury trial for. Um, so when you reference the federal law, uh, that gets dangerous because the federal law has been interpreted to give a lot of these lesser included and we just we just want it for the one We just want to stick to Anderson. So that was the concern with listing it there. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair Absolutely, uh, it looks like we have no further questions. So we will move to testimony in support of AB 42 I think we have some people present to give uh, support testimony So we'll take you first here in the room and you will have two minutes Hi, Liz Ortenberger for the record, O-R-T-E-N-B-U-R-G-E-R. -E -E Thank you to the chair and the committee for hearing this bill and the city of Henderson for bringing it forward. I'm the CEO for Safe Nest. We're on the front line of the epidemic of domestic violence every day, serving over 25,000 clients annually. We're in full support of this bill as it ends the fire harm loophole created by the municipal courts in response to Anderson. Why is ending this critical? Because the chance of homicide for a domestic violence victim is 500% higher when there is a firearm in the home. And that's not just the primary victim. That includes children, grandparents, and acquaintances of the victim who are also likely to be murdered if they are in the vicinity. Nevada remains in the top 10 most dangerous places for women being murdered by men in the country. 50 to 80% of that is with gunshots. We must close this loophole for the survivors of domestic violence who deserve to know that their batterer will not be their murderer. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else present to give testimony in support of AB 42? Not seeing anybody present, so we will turn it over to broadcast, please. Thank you, Chair Shepard. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 42, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in support on Assembly Bill 42, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 540, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Serena Evans, S-E-R-E-N-A-E-V-A-N-S, and I'm the policy coordinator for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. And we're here today in strong support of AB 42. We appreciate the city of Henderson collaborating with other jurisdictions over the interim to bring this bill in response to the Anderson v. State ruling. We're in favor of this bill as it establishes in state statute that municipal courts have the authority to conduct jury trials, ensuring municipal courts are able to hold domestic violence offenders accountable. Seconding what Liz Ortenberger said before me, it is imperative that domestic violence offenders are held accountable and when convicted lose their right to bear or purchase any firearms because of the drastic increased risk to domestic violence victim survivors. This bill will make sure that there is uniformity in the processing of domestic violence cases in all municipal courts throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, caller. For those of you that just joined us, we are currently on support testimony for Assembly Bill 42. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 468, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Carlene Helbert, C-A-R-L-E-N-E. H-E-L-B-E-R-T, and I am Deputy City Attorney for the City of Las Vegas, testifying in strong support for AB 42. Although AB 42 has a lot of legal language involving jurisdiction, court functions, and definitions, at its core, it is a bill about victim safety. Since the Anderson decision, prosecuting these cases has been frustrating, to say the least. Our office, which is referred between 3,500 and 5,000 cases a year, has had domestic violence cases dismissed outright, with two of our six courts saying that they do not have jurisdiction to hear a case if it requires a jury trial. We have had convictions under our ordinance where a victim who has just testified about the abuse will leave with her abuser and go back home to a place that we know has firearms. We've, other, we've had other victims concerned about retaliation because they know a defendant can be violent. And I have to explain to that abuse to, I have to explain that that abuser, even if convicted, can still keep their guns because it's unclear whether or not we can do a jury trial. Victim safety has been eroded by the current ambiguity in the law. The fact is domestic violence is one of the most common types of violent crimes in Nevada. In 2019, the Nevada Attorney General's Office noted nearly 25,000 reports of domestic violence. Simply put, we need every town, city and municipality in Nevada to help combat this issue, prosecute these cases, hold offenders accountable, and keep victims safe. AB 42 allows for the continued prosecution of these violence cases within city jurisdictions. Adoption of this bill allows you to resolve an important issue in a few weeks, which would otherwise take the court years to decide. We thank the city of Henderson for introducing the bill and thank the committee for their time. Thank you, caller. Uh, for those of you that recently joined us, we are currently on support testimony for Assembly Bill 42. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 584. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Scheibel and committee members. For the record, I'm Allison McCormick, A-L-Y-S-O-N-M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K. I'm an assistant city manager for the city of Sparks, testifying in support of AB 42. After the Nevada Supreme Court determined that a jury trial is required for certain domestic battery offenses, the city of Sparks adopted an ordinance allowing its municipal court to hold jury trials when constitutionally required. That ordinance was a stopgap measure to hold domestic violence offenders accountable until the Nevada legislature could act. AB 42 would remove all doubt as to whether Sparks Municipal Court may hold jury trials if constitutionally required to do so. The city of Sparks does have concerns about the logistics and the costs of 12-person juries and questions whether 12-person juries are constitutionally required for misdemeanor offenses like these. However, we will continue to work with the City of Henderson on that issue, and we thank the City of Henderson for introducing AB 42. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 938. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Ariel Edwards, A-R-I-E-L-L-E-E-D-W-A-R-D-S with the City of North Las Vegas. We are in support of Assembly Bill 42. We would like to thank the bill sponsors for working with the city and we are in support of the amendment that has been proposed. AB 42 gives additional clarity to the NRS as it pertains to prosecuting battery domestic violence cases. As we understand AB 42, if the city of North Las Vegas wants to continue prosecuting battery domestic violence cases, that jury trials will be required unless waived by the defendant. 
That being said, we would like to state for the record that our support comes with the cost to the city of North Las Vegas. We have submitted a fiscal note regarding AB 42. The fiscal note would be substantial due to the need for retrofit and expansion of our municipal courts to house such cases. Um, and we support the effective date for passage in the bill to accommodate these cases. So again, we'd like to thank the city of Henderson for working with us and thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 648. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and maybe begin. Thank you, Chair Scheibel, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is John Jones, J-O-H-N-J-O-N-E-S, here on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association. We are in support of AB 42. And I want to start off by thanking the City of Henderson, Ms. Rourke, and Mr. Skifalakwa for bringing the bill. Simply put, AB 42 provides clarity. And first, it clarifies that municipal courts can hold domestic violence trials. It would be disastrous for domestic violence prosecutions if a future court ruling held that municipal courts did not have jurisdiction over DV trials. A ruling like this would require the county DA's offices to handle all domestic violence cases within a county. And as Mr. Skipalakwa indicated, the southern municipal jurisdictions uh, in Clark County combined handle more of these cases than the Clark County DA's office. Clark County DA cannot more than double our caseload and still provide the justice that domestic violence victims deserve. Second, we fully support moving away from the federal definition in the prohibited person of a firearm statute. Moving away from the federal definition will provide clarity as to which defendants are prohibited from possessing a firearm. We urge this committee to pass AB 42. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 294. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Chair Scheibel and members of the committee, for the record, Callie Wilsey with the City of Reno. That's C-A-L-L-I-W-I-L-S as in Sam E-Y. We are here in support of AB 42 today. We support this bill as it provides needed clarity and confirmation as mentioned by several of my colleagues from other municipalities today. We appreciate the city of Henderson recognizing this need and bringing forward the bill. We also wanna thank the city of Henderson for working with us early in the process to resolve a minor operational we had uh, related to the role of our police chief and chief marshal in our local system. Uh, prior to the bill heading to a work session, we hope to seek additional clarity with the bill sponsor on the constitutionality question that was raised and discussed today related to number of jurors. We believe this question is not as clear and we've made changes to our courts under a different interpretation. The change uh, to 12 could create logistical and fiscal challenges for us. Uh, but we look forward to that conversation to get some additional information and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 456. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee. My name is AJ Delap of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. My last name is phonetically spelled David Easy Lincoln Adam Paul for the record. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department is in support of AB 42 and its provisions. And with that, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee, I would like to thank you in, uh, for your time and conclude my short testimony. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And with that, Chair Scheibel, there are no more callers to provide support testimony at this time. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. We will move to testimony in opposition to AB 42. I believe we have somebody present to give testimony and I will allow them to go first for two minutes. Good afternoon, Chair. John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We had submitted a proposed revision uh, and that is the only reason we're in opposition. If Section 12, subsection 10A of the original bill is uh, amended. That would pull us out of opposition. Uh, there were several DAs uh, down south that made the argument that 
once you have a prior felony or a prior battery domestic violence conviction, then you're no longer entitled to a jury trial. Um, we have opposed that argument, and just recently Judge Holthus, a former prosecutor who is now a judge, ruled against the state for making that argument. So we are firm in our opinion that the right to a jury trial attaches to the charge itself. Uh, and so <clears throat> that would be said. As far as the 12 jurors go, um, everybody said in 2017 when I was here that if we enacted jury trials for these type of charges, it would be, the consequences would be disastrous. And we, we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I fully do believe that municipal courts should have the right to hold jury trials because they do handle a lot of the cases. We just want to see some of the bill adjusted. I also think that a lot of the issues could be handled with interlocal agreements while courtrooms are being outfitted. The Henderson Justice Court, which is just one floor below the Henderson Municipal Court, does have a jury box. And so perhaps municipal courts could handle their jury trials in there. The floodgates have not opened on jury trials around the state um, I believe we're still at less than 20, even though this decision has been quite a, quite a time being, and we may even be less than that. So there's no need to worry, and I think interlocal agreements will get us through this little phase that we're in before the municipal courts ready themselves to handle jurors in their courtrooms. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, members of the committee, Kendra Birchie with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. We are also in opposition, mostly just on what we provided in our amendments um, with some additional clarity that we would like to see in this bill in order to ensure that we are all operating under the same system across this state. Um, I'm not going to go through all the amendments because we did submit that and they are located on Nellis. Uh, the main one, as Mr. Pirro indicated, is what we've proposed for amendment number one where we do believe that it's necessary to change the language, ensure that we are complying with the Nevada Constitution, specifically Article 1, Section 3, and ensuring that everyone who has a right to a jury trial is receiving that jury trial. As Mr. Pirro alluded to, there are um, concerns that are going across Nevada, and so we believe that everyone who is charged with that uh, domestic battery, regardless of the jurisdiction, should be an, an afforded that jury trial right. Um, and since I do have a... Um, a judicial officer seated next to me at this moment. I will give a shout out to um, up in Washoe County. I think that we've done a very great job of working with all stakeholders um, after the Anderson decision came out to see how we can um, allow for jury trials to proceed in our different courts. It's my understanding, unless that's changed since I've been here for the legislative session, that we unfortunately have not been able to conduct a domestic battery jury trial, but that's not due to lack of trying. That's also due to COVID. Um, so I do appreciate the stakeholders for meeting with us at great length um, and also agree that there needs to be a further clarity with Section 13 to ensure that we are not including our vulnerable adults, wards of guardianships. So I appreciate um, those discussions and look forward to continuing to discuss this bill with the sponsors. Thank you. Uh, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee, my name is Kevin Higgins. I'm the Chief Judge in the Sparks Justice Court. I'm also appearing on behalf of the Nevada Judges of Limited Jurisdiction, which is the association of all the lower court judges in Nevada. Uh, reluctantly, we're opposed to subsection Section 3 of the bill, which would increase the size of the juries in Justice Smith's little courts to, from 6 to 12 jurors. We don't think that's constitutionally required. We don't think it's required by case law. And I think the adverse consequences to many of our courts uh, outweigh that. Um, Few of our courts in Nevada have room for six jurors, and they're struggling with that. Fewer still can accommodate 12 and a veneer of 50. Uh, the original bill did not have that change in it. It was uh, amended, I believe, on the floor. Um, as noted, uh, the Nevada Constitution is silent on the number of jurors. It just says the right to the jury trial is inviolate. Um, later, case law talked about the number of jurors. Since 1983, the NRS has limited the number of the jurors in criminal cases in justice court to six. And um, um, there used to be a fair number of jury trials in justice court. The statute has allowed for it a long time. It was just not an option that was taken by most. Uh, talking to some of our uh, senior judges, that was uh, common in, in, in Washoe County, at least, through most of the 70s and 80s to have jury trials on DUIs. The wait, though, was a two- to three-year wait to get those jury trials. So there were some significant problems with that. Um, I'm unaware of any case law in Nevada or any case in Nevada, and, and, and I'm sure the folks in Henderson maybe have different information, but 
that challenges the six jurors that are allowed in, in, in justice court. Now, the two cases, the two Nevada cases from 1876, I think if you take a closer look at them, they don't require 12 person jurors in justice court. Uh, the McClear case dealt with an act of the legislature that did away with all the challenges for cause in Nevada, and they were litigating whether or not that was appropriate. McClear said it was. And this was a felony case. It was a case over a rape. It was a district court case. It was not a lower court case. Um, of course, McClure also said, based on the common law, that jurors meant 12 competent men. So pushing McClure to its uh, logical, maybe not illogical conclusion, half the people in this building couldn't sit on a jury if we were following McClure today, uh, based on their decision. The Borowski case uh, was an impeachment case. The county, uh, county assessor, I think it was in Washoe County, had. Uh, uh, taken a bunch of money and walked off the job. The question was whether the district court could handle the case. Uh, the term misdemeanor was used in the statute. It was really an impeachment stat case that he was being impeached for a high crime and misdemeanor. The district court said yes. Uh, the Supreme Court said the district court could hear the case even though the phrase uh, uh, misdemeanor was used and he was found guilty in district court. And as a, as a historical note, he was sentenced to a $2,000 fine which he was allowed to pay off at $2 a day in prison. So he, he'd had a $1,000 prison sentence to pay off his $2,000 fine. But both of these are felony cases. These are not lower court cases. They don't address the case. Um, uh, many states have chosen to give greater uh, constitutional rights in many case, places, including the number of jurors across the United States. But the US Supreme Court has said repeatedly that six person juries in lower courts are constitutional. Now, Nevada can choose to go to 12 jurors, um, I don't think it's constitutional or statutory required, though. Our essential problem with the amendment is the unintended consequences. I think it's going to be practically impossible for many courts in Nevada to host a 12-person jury. Um, I have, I have a, basically a brand new courthouse, eight, eight years old. We, have a, we built a jury box anticipating short-form civil jury trials. So there's six seats in it, four and two alternates. We are looking at how to squeeze seven. We're probably going to have to have people out on folding chairs uh, to, to accommodate a 12-person jury plus two uh, is probably going to require a chainsaw and uh, a significant amount of work in my courtroom. We've actually gone looked at a bid for 75,000 plus. When you take social distancing in and a veneer of probably 50 to get 12 people, I'm not sure we have any place in our courtroom house to put 50 people that are socially distanced. So our, our concern is really the practical, pragmatic consequence of increasing the number, the number of jurors. We can end up in uh, high school gyms and Elks Halls across Nevada that are, that are big enough, but there, there are no uh, benches and, and security and, and recording equipment and jury boxes. I mean, it's possible to do, but the consequences, I, I, I think, are unintended. And I think that anything that causes it to be more difficult to hold a jury trial in a domestic violence case should be avoided. Um, I think making it as difficult as this might be in some jurisdictions may very well lead to different charging decisions um, if there's a question about whether it's appropriate. I think we've seen fewer domestic violence cases charged in Washoe County uh, since Anderson happened. I can't, that's anecdotal. I haven't done a statistical analysis. We're ready to go in Sparks with a six person jury. We have 22 backed up. Um, but because of COVID, we haven't been able to do it. We're working with the county, uh, the, 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 the district court jury commissioner will be start pulling the jurors here in, in, in July. We've looked at several alternates. Could, can I? Uh, sit in Reno in district court and hold the case there. I'm not sure my criminal jurisdiction moves from Sparks to Reno. And so that's a, re uh, that, that's a question that would have to be resolved. Uh, we have many small townships in Nevada that aren't located in the same t city or town where, where the district court is. You know, so we have townships that are less than 1,000 people. I mean, the Lander County, the Austin Township has 287 people in it. I mean, you're, you're going to be, to call 50 people, you're going to have to call a, a quarter of the, of the people that live in the township to, to pull, whether he can go up to uh, the Argenta Township in Battle Mountain and hold the trial there, I think we're, that's an open question we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to address. We, we are in no way opposed to jury trials in these cases. We think it's absolutely important. Um, I, you know, I've been on the bench 18 years. I, I, I know what, what domestic violence does to families and the victims, uh, but I think those cases need to be resolved quickly uh, and not being pushed out. And, and making it more difficult, I, I'm, I fear, will make they'll take those cases longer to go. Uh, on balance, I think the possible question about whether those jurors, six-person juries, may be unconstitutional should be left to the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court tells us we have to have 12, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. 
we're used to doing what the Supreme Court tells us to do. And as well as the legislature, we're used to doing what you tell us to do too. But the, 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 that, that off chance that that might be unconstitutional, I think is outweighed by the, 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 the collateral consequences, the unintended consequences, the new courthouses that have to be built, uh, the jurisdictional questions, I, I just think in rural Nevada is going to be very difficult to accommodate this. If we have to, we'll make it work. But I don't think the trials are going to be in the justice court. They're going to, they're going to have to be somewhere else. So we, we agree, and I, you know, I agree with the, the folks in the city of Henderson. Other than this, this late change to the number of jurors, we're, we're, we're fully behind this bill. Our, our question is a pragmatic and a practical one, uh, how we're going to make it work. And that's the only reason we're opposed to Section 3. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like Senator Pickard has a question. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Judge. I, I appreciate it. sounds like um, uh, you have already done the research that I started but did, couldn't get very deep in. Uh, when it comes to six-person juries, yes, we already do those in, in small civil cases. Um, uh, in, in your experience, it sounds like you haven't done any in a uh, uh, misdemeanor case, but there is some history of that. Um, have we, and you said that we haven't seen any challenges. Um, I'm wondering if that meant that we haven't seen anyone challenge it or we haven't seen any reported decisions uh, opining as to whether or not uh, uh, that's the case. Um, I, I'm just trying to look at the landscape because I agree. I, I think I would interpret the law and particularly the history. Um, I don't see, I mean, we change uh, things all the time. The Supreme Court will give um, uh, deference to the, uh, to use a word I don't like to use, um, uh, to the legislature because we change law all the time and the Constitution doesn't specify 12 jurors. It, it just says jury trials. So do you know, has this ever been challenged? Has every, anyone ever uh, brought this to the court and then the court declined? Because that declination might also be in, indicative of a tolerance for a six-person jury. Um, I'm unaware of any challenge, and, and, and I'm certainly not aware of what's happening. Put your name on the well. record, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin Higgins, uh, Sparks Justice Court. I, I'm unaware of any challenges to the six-person jurors. I know the Supreme Court's had the opportunity. There have been two or three decisions addressing collateral issues uh, since Anderson. Nothing's been said about the number of jurors. I mean, um, uh, it hasn't been addressed. We, uh, uh, one of my senior judges that sits for us used to sit at the Lake and in Reno in the 80s. They did jury trials in justice court. They did them for DUIs. They, to my knowledge, they were six-person jurors. And since 83, our statute has said in criminal cases in justice court, six-person jurors are appropriate. So. There, but maybe very well, you know, uh, there's 152,000 people in my township. There's 2 million people in, in Las Vegas. There could very well be challenges pending in Vegas that I don't know about. But I, I, I don't know, and I'm not I'm aware of any case from the Supreme Court that's addressed it. Thank you. Senator Orenshaw. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Your Honor, for being here. One question uh, based on Mr. Schifalakwa's testimony. If, if let's say you went with trials with just six jurors, is there a risk of those decisions being overturned if later an appellate court says that, you know, we thought we were right, but no, you weren't right. Really, 12 is the magic number that we needed. So I just wonder what kind of danger we might have of a lot of decisions being overturned. Uh, Chair Scheibel, Kevin Higgins, the Sparks Justice Court. There is some complicated case law on the retroactivity of constitutional rights. But I think if the case is concluded by the time the Supreme Court says, oh, we, we think 12, I don't believe they're going to retroactively um, go back and change any of the prior cases. Now, if a case is midway through trial or hasn't had a final decision made in it, that's, that's a possibility if they change a fundamental constitutional right. Retroactively, though, I don't believe it would affect any cases that are completed uh, before they found something unconstitutional. Um, I, we haven't even, sometimes they throw things into footnotes. I mean, we haven't even gotten a hint that there's any problem with six-person jurors, but you're reading between the lines on that one. I don't, I don't think it would be a huge problem, no. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Chair. Senator Harris. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. Uh, if your courtroom was currently uh, set up to do 12-person juries, would you still be in opposition? Well, I'm, I'm personally, no, probably not, but I'm also here on behalf of the you know, 95 limited jurisdiction judges in Nevada, and, I think some of the bigger courthouses could handle it. I'm just, Austin and Beatty and Eureka and uh, uh, 
those, those courts are going to be trouble. I, I don't think it's constitutionally required. If you want to make a, a legislative decision that's required, well, of course we'll do that. I guess my concern is putting a price on a constitutional right. Uh, you know, I mean, it's expensive to do a jury trial in the first place, right? And at, at one point, those weren't required, and then we forced everybody to, to get with it because we decided that's what people deserve, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I guess that's, that's all. Well, if I, just, just a brief response, uh, Kevin Higgins. Um, I, I agree with you. We shouldn't put a price on a constitutional right. Um, I'm not sure, though, with saying that, that there's a constitutional right to 12 person jury trials in justice court. Um, if our Supreme Court says that, we're, you know, I'm going to be calling the county and saying we got to start knocking walls out. But um, until that happens, I would like to do what is required. One quick follow up. Sorry. Thank you. Is the only way to find out if the Supreme Court requires a 12 constitutional jury to first do a six and then have it raised and challenged? I, I perhaps uh, Kevin Higgins. I, I understand there have been some cases held in, in Clark County. I know the Reno Justice Court had two seated, and then the cases were canceled before they happened. Um, uh, we've, we call, we're in the process of calling one jury before COVID, and that got canceled. So theoretically, it would it, it potentially require somebody to be convicted and, 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 and appeal it. But um, yeah. I have not had much luck asking Supreme Court justices, you know, between us kids, what are you, what are you thinking? So maybe you have better luck than I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, are there other questions? Senator Hansen. Oh, just a quick apology. I had to step out for a minute, but I just want to say hi. I, Kevin Higgins and I actually grew up together. We're in Boy Scouts, went to Sparks High School together. He and Alexis are friends, too. And he was sitting out there, and I didn't even recognize him. Your hair was darker last time. Yes, yes, it was. And, and I might have had some still. It's been a while. So just want to get that on the record. Great to see you again, Your Honor. Thank you for your great service to the city of Sparks. Oh, thank you. We were both, Madam Chair, we were both railroader, rail, Sparks Railroaders, so. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, we certainly do appreciate you being here and subjecting yourself to our questions. And uh, we will allow you to return to the safety of the seats behind you and move to anybody else in opposition to AB 42. I don't see anybody else present, so we will go to broadcast, please, for any additional opposition testimony. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 42, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 42, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Call her with the last three digits, 502. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Chair Scheibel and members of the committee, for the record, Dan Reed, D-A-N-R-E-I-D, with the National Rifle, Rifle Association here in opposition today. Um, while we are uh, appreciative of the bill and the due process protections and enhancements that it provides, um, our opposition is limited to Section 13 and the expansion beyond the federal law for a lifetime firearm prohibition for misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. Um, we have worked with the sponsors of this bill, and we will continue to try and do that. But um, with the change in who can be prohibited and um, for these misdemeanor crimes, that, that's just a bridge too far for us and we will be in opposition at this time. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 080, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hi. Jim Hoffman, Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice. NACJ opposes AB 42. I want to note that we're not opposed to the concept of allowing municipal courts to hold jury trials for domestic violence charges. But it's important to get the details right. We don't feel that the bill is currently drafted does that. I would also note that the whole reason we're here in the first place is that the Supreme Court found that the existing version of these statutes was unconstitutional. So if the legislature doesn't get the details right now, that opens us up for further constitutional litigation and uncertainty, and nobody wants that. We believe it's better to get it right now, not have to come back again next session. I want to close by thanking the bill's proponent for continuing to discuss this issue with us. 
and note that we would move into support with the adoption of Mr. Pirro and Ms. Birchie's amendment. But as it currently stands, we are opposed. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And with that, Chair Scheibel, there are no more callers to provide opposition testimony at this time. Okay, thank you for your help. We will move to testimony in the neutral position on AB 42. I don't see anybody in the room to give neutral testimony, so we will go to broadcast, please, for neutral testimony on AB 42. Thank you, Chair Shuttle. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 42, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in the neutral standing on Assembly Bill 42, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. And Chair, the phone lines are open and working. However, there are no callers to provide neutral testimony at this time. All right, thank you so much. Um, would the presenters like to make any closing comments? Welcome back, Mr. Skifalakwa. Thank you, Mark Skifalakwa. I just wanted to uh, thank the committee, thank all the, uh, uh, those who testified uh, in, in both ways. I do appreciate the comments. Um, the good news is it doesn't sound like anybody's really opposed to the municipalities having the clear right to do the jury trials and move forward. So I think that's a positive, uh, a positive thing. Um, I would also like to note that, you know, I keep coming back to the Constitution, the right by jury shall be secured to all and remain inviolate forever. It doesn't say just those in a certain court. Uh, it says to all. Um, now, that being said, that is my interpretation, and that's why, you know, we have the 12. Uh, the practical concerns are real. We will, um, with everyone's permission, circle back with the LCB legal team, uh, see if we can look at this again, uh, see if there's anything anybody's missing, and uh, if needs be um, to change that. But we'll definitely uh, have that discussion. I do want to thank uh, everyone today. Thank you so much. We appreciate you and everybody who weighed in today. That concludes the hearing on AB 42. I will now close that hearing and we will move on to public comment. Is there anybody present to give public comment? I don't see anyone, so broadcast, I will turn it over to you for public comment. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. We are currently on public comment this afternoon. If you'd like to provide public comment at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair Scheibel, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. All right. Thank you so much. In that case, we are uh, finished for today. We will have another meeting tomorrow at 1 p.m. Until that time, we are adjourned. Correction. We do not have a meeting tomorrow. Tomorrow is the um, Peace Officers Memorial Dedication Ceremony, and I anticipate seeing many of you there. <laughs>